Good evening. And welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's not the Alpha Church Guys Hour. Good evening and welcome to Faith of Victory Church Online. Praise the Lord for our Wednesday night Bible study. So glad to have you tonight uh, as we continue along the lines of the Bible in the light of our redemption. A basic Bible study course by E.W. Kenyon. Again, this <clears throat> this um, wonderful work, this book is available online uh, at Amazon.com, I believe at Walmart.com for about around $15. We encourage you to get it and have it in your library. Again, the Bible in the light of our redemption by E.W. Kenyon. Uh, we're on lesson 14 or 37. Um, and very easy for you to go back and catch up and, and answer the questions, watch our videos and get the answers to the different questions from each chapter. Um, so uh, it's never too late to jump in here and, and get this book and uh, add it to your library and study it. it. It's a wonderful thing for you to study yourself and uh, to go through. Praise the Lord. Uh, last couple of weeks, we were talking about the tabernacle. And um, obviously, you know, everything that we're talking about is in the light of our redemption. You know, the foreshadowings and et cetera of the Old Testament taking us obviously ultimately into the New Testament. Um, but we're going to pick up there with the um, with the um, tabernacle and move down into the priesthood. Obviously, that's tied together. Uh, the tabernacle and its vessels and the priesthood and the various ministries connected there with formed one subject. In other words, the, the, the tabernacle without the priesthood or the priesthood without the tabernacle uh, weren't complete. You needed, you needed both aspects of that in order uh, for the foreshadowing and the typology uh, to be realized and for God to be laying down the plan ahead of time. Praise the Lord. So um, we're just we're dividing it up and, and contemplating each aspect. So the tabernacle would have been useless without its vessels. The uh, tabernacle with its vessels would have been of no service, but for a living family of priests, uh, constantly engaged in the various activities within the holy place about the ho various holy vessels. They acted as mediators. Hebrews 8 shows us that the priest who offered gifts according to the law served unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. Um, in, in Exodus chapter 28, Exodus, and we welcome all of you that are tuning in now. So glad to have you. Um, maybe just all of a sudden, uh, 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 so a woman used to be in our church in Greenwood years ago, Sister Eagle. God love you, honey. Um, she was a Northern Italian a Catholic who had gotten born again and filled with the Holy Ghost, and she always told us, God love you, honey. Remember her, Janie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Exodus 28, 1 says, Thou shalt take thee Aaron, thy brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me uh, in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And um, so God begins to lay out the pattern and uh, different things for um, the priesthood. And... Um, Moses or his sons had nothing to do with the priesthood under the law and that of which Christ is the head. The leadership or kingship, we could say, of Moses as well as the office of mediator were in him kept apart from the priesthood, which was confined to Aaron and his sons. Um, and these dig uh, dignities were thus lodged in different persons Whereas one epistle to the Hebrews is to point out that the Lord Jesus in his resurrection, combining in himself the various offices and dignities of Lord, mediator, apostle, surety, captain, and shepherd. So there were different uh, things that were done, but Jesus became them all. He is the all in all. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, just a moment. The wording of this verse we read there in uh, Exodus 28, 1, take thou into the air and thy brother and his sons with him that he may minister. Um, 
Aaron and his sons formed but one ministry in the priest's office, and Aaron could not exercise his service unless his sons were taken with him. Is there not in this an intimation of the union and priesthood of Christ and his house? Hallelujah. And that one great object of his priesthood is that he may minister to God respecting his house. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. I mean, we're going from Exodus to Hebrews. Hope y'all have had a great day. Hallelujah. Verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him as Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, and he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as the son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast in confidence and the rejoicing of hope unto the end, firm unto the end, wherefore, as the, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice. Hallelujah. And so um, Jesus is the head over our house. Praise God. The high, uh, and so next, the high priest under the law had compassion on the ignorant and on them that were out of the way because he was conscious of infirmities in himself. The very fact of, him, uh, of, of his being himself a sinner was one qualification for that priesthood. So remember the high priest being a sinner had great compassion on people because he himself had to be uh, forgiven and covered and uh, separated by God. And um, so he would demonstrate compassion and mercy. Glory to God. The Lord Jesus through his human life was perfect, perfected for priesthood. He's able to symp sympathize because the Bible says this, he had been tempted at all points like we are, yet without sin. He suffered, he was tempted, he was therefore able to succor them that are tempted. Praise the Lord. In other words, he faced in kind everything that humanity faces, and yet without sin. He overcame. He did not fail. He did not fall. He did not go under. He did not succumb to it. Praise God. The dreadful whisperings of the enemy that he was called to endure filled his soul with holy abhorrence and taught him to feel pity for us who are subject to the assaults of Satan. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14. Seeing then we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus, being tempted, overcoming and never sinning, is able to minister to us out of compassion. Compassion is powerful. Um, compassion comes from the Greek sympathuo. Sympathy, uh, sympathuo. Um, we try to, a lot of times translate it pity. But it means to, um, it kind of carries the to, to the the the, um, the person expressing sympathy felt the same that the person who's going through it. It was like a, a joint suffering, and Jesus 
bore that for us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The priests of the house of Levi were made without an oath, and in consequence, some of them were cut off from the priesthood, as in the case of Nadab and Abihu and Eli's uh, line. The Lord was made perfect, was made priest with an oath. The Lord had sworn and will not repent, Psalm 110 verse 4 says. The unchangeableness of God's word and oath established the Lord Jesus as the surety of the better covenant, Hebrews chapter 7 verses 20 through 25. Aaron was made priest after the law of cardinal, carnal, not cardinal, carnal, hallelujah, commandments, <clears throat> whereas Christ became high priest after the power of endless life, the glorious eternal power of resurrection, life received out of death and making manifest his victory over death const constituted him the great high priest. He is our high priest forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Establishes the high priest. Now let's look at the garments of the high priest. Um, Exodus 28, 4 says, These are the garments which shall make a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat and a mitre and a garment. Mitre's a hat. That, that, that weird looking. And that really kind of like a chef's hat, but you know, tall, however that, you know, anyway, it's a hat. And a girdle. Without these, Aaron could not be a high priest. They typified various powers, responsibilities, and qualities connected to the office. The priestly garments were considered a part of the work of the tabernacle. The robes of the high priest express the function and quality of the high priest. And then the materials are specific. Gold, fine twine linen, uh, others were blue, purple, scarlet, or colors emblazoned, <laughs> emblazoned, thank you, Lord, for helping me get that word out. Emblazoned upon the fine twi uh, twine linen and everywhere interlaced with gold. The mode in which this was done is described in Exodus 39.3. Interesting uh, how they did this. They did beat the gold into thin plates and cut it into wires to work it into the blue, into the purple, into the scarlet, and the fine linen with cunning work. In other words, they, they would take gold and beat it into a thin plate <clears throat> and then cut it into wires, and then they would weave it like thread into this uh, other material. The various phases of manhood are typified by the color. Gold represents his divinity. They're inseparably uh, connected yet distinct. Christ's life was a rare and beautiful union of humanity and divinity. Yet there was a mysterious distinction between his humanity and divinity. With perfect ease, he went from the sphere of his human ability to the sphere of the divine. He was equally at home, equally at home, within one or the other. At the grave of Lazarus, Lazarus, he is seeing a very man and a very God. Remember, he wept, and this Lazarus come forth. Glory to God. One moment he's weeping, next minute he's saying, Lazarus, come forth. It makes you think of Carmen, don't it? Lazarus, oh, Lazarus, come forth. We'll see if y'all awake out there. I'm not seeing any comments. I figured I'd get a hand clap or something after that one. Hallelujah. The ephod, the great priestly robe, was inseparably connected with the shoulder pieces and the breastplate. The strength of the shoulders and the affections of the heart were devoted to the interest of the people whom he represented. It was symbolic, okay? The omnipotent strength and infinite love of Christ, our great high priest, are ours continually and unquestionably. Okay? 
That's why God, God was so specific and how everything had to be done because he was laying out allegories, allegories and uh, typologies all pointing us to his heart manifest in his son to us. Hallelujah. The shoulders, the shoulders that sustained the universe upheld the weakest member of his body. The priesthood was God's provision to lead Israel into his presence and keep them there. It was God's provision for spiritually dead Israel that they might have an approach to him. In Exodus 28, 15 through 29, and uh, chapter 39, verses 8 through 21, they tell of the breastplate with the names of the 12 tribes engraved upon precious stones. The peculiar excellence of a precious stone is that the more intense the light is, the more brightly it shines. These are maintained in divine presence and undiminished luster and an unalterable beauty that belong to the uh, position in which the grace of God had set them. Praise God. Whenever the failures of Israel might be, their names glittered before God. Jehovah had set them where no man could pluck them. No man could enter into the holy place to dim their luster. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Each tribe had its place in its own stone. Each stone had its own peculiar glory and beauty. Each differed from, without rivaling, the other, and each filled its appointed place before God. God was able to create variety without involving inferiority. That's unlike today. We we think, you know, equity means you take away from somebody who's got and give it to the one who don't have so everybody's on the same plane. No, you're bringing something, you're bringing something down to bring something up. He was able to bring everybody up. Hallelujah. And it is so with the individuals that compose the body of Christ. And yet Christ in, in, is seen in each with a peculiar beauty and glory into which another does not intrude. Each has his place in the body, a responsibility to magnify Christ that does not belong to another. We being many are one body and members in particular. Glory to God. In the view of the Father, the body shines with the brightness, the righteousness of Christ. Man cannot see, but God can see us in Christ, his right in his righteousness and beauty. <clears throat> the great shepherd of the sheep will not cease to hear, bear on his shoulders and heart the weakness of the flock until at last he presents him faultless, without blame, before the Father. <clears throat> when the resurrection among uh, morning comes, every one of the redeemed will be like Christ and will be man manifest in the same beauty and glory in which he is now represent uh, representatively upheld on the shoulders of the great high priest before God. In other words, you're not going to have the well-known preacher have a different righteousness than the guy you never heard of who, who may be considered a weak link. When we're all presented before the Father, we'll be presented heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. Be bearing the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. We, we will be on equal terms in the sense that God has made us one with him and he has surrounded all of us with all that he is. And everything he has bears us all up. Hallelujah. And lifts us all up. Now the memorial. Thou, uh, Exodus 28, 12. Thou shalt put, upon, uh, put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod. For the stones of the memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his shoulders before a memorial. Israel had one feast to which this word memorial was particularly 
attached. The Feast of the Passover. In Exodus 12, 14, This day shall be unto you a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. They had therefore two constant reasons for remembering Jehovah. One, the deliverance from bondage in Egypt by the blood of the Paschal Lamb. And two, their acceptance into the brilliancy and glory of precious stones before the Lord on the shoulder of the high priest. These are two memorials to us who are his children. Our absolute redemption from the king, king of darkness, through the blood of the lamb, and our standing before God as his children, upheld in his presence in all glory and righteousness. Praise God. Hallelujah. Just as Aaron could not enter into the holy place without reminding Jehovah of the love and perfection in which Israel stood, accepted before him, we have a constant memorial before him in our great high priest who brings us before him. He is our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. Praise God. God's good. And, you know, to try to say, to have somebody make this up thousands of years apart, a typology, and then bring out the typology in Christ, it would it'd be impossible. Unless the great author of all things is God, who knew all things beginning from the end and end from the beginning and everything in between. Okay, let's look at the Urim and the Thurm, Thuman. Um, Found in Exodus 28, 30, the breastplate was made of the same materials as the ephod and it was doubled or folded to form a bag into which the ermine and thumen were put. The ermine and the thumen were precious stones bearing significant names. And listen to this, that no one has at present ever been able to know. They don't know what was written on them. Hallelujah. Now, ermine means lights and thumen means perfection. These mysterious contents of the breastplate seem to direct our thoughts to the heart of the Lord Jesus as containing all light and perfection, all grace and truth, all mercy and righteousness. In Ephesians 5.13, it says, Whatsoever doth make manifest is light. The high priest with the umen, ermen and his breastplate became the channel by which God made manifest his counsels. The Lord Jesus makes known the counsels and purposes of God. He is light, and in him is no darkness. And through him, God's will is made known unto us. Praise the Lord. Makes you think of the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, where the thing comes out of the ark, hits the, hits the uh, breastplate, and, you know, it goes out. But that's not how God, you know, they weren't going to kill everybody. It was... Uh, Remind God of his covenant and Jesus coming to redeem us. <clears throat> but Hollywood, you know, it was still pretty cool. The gold bells and pomegranates. Around the skirts were placed pomegranates of three colors, blue, purple, and scarlet. And altered with each pomegranate was a bell of pure gold. The only adornings of this heavenly robe were fruits gathered from the earth. The high priest thus proclaimed on his entrance from the holiest that he had come from the world, proclaiming his earth wall. Pomegranates are especially mentioned as fruits of the Holy Land. <clears throat> Between each two pomegranates was a golden bell. The golden sound was connected with a rich, juicy fruit, and as the high priest approached the most high place, his steps sent forth a heavenly melody which he returned again from the immediate presence of the glory into the camp, his retiring footsteps rang out the unearthly sound. They proclaim his heavenly walk in the most holy place. Think about it. Also, the pomegranate and the bell, the pomegranate tempered the sound of the bell. And um, some people like, you know, fruit, love. Because without the fruit of the Spirit, uh, the power of the Spirit 
is a clangy cymbal and tinkling bell. It would just be banging together. But tempered by the spiritual fruit of um, identification with Christ and being brought together. Hallelujah. Where the life of God's on the inside of us. Praise the Lord. Uh, tempers the power and makes it a beautiful sound. Hallelujah. As the high priest approached God, God must hear the heavenly sound sent forth by his feet, by his feet steps. Bless my heart, by his footsteps. I don't know if you got feet steps or not. I, I, I think it's supposed to be footsteps. What do y'all think? Although he came from the midst of a, of a den of worldliness and confusion, his walk, though surrounded by these sins, must be respecting the fruitfulness to God and, thus, and must not be in regard to earthly ambitions or glory or prosperity. Again, his retiring footsteps from the immediate presence of God were to speak the same truth. He must return into the ordinary occupations of life, uh, still making his footsteps known as from heaven. How lovely on the mountains of them who bring glad tidings of good things, who declare thy God reigneth. Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, the mitre found in Exodus 29, 39, and 39, 28 um, is, a, is a word that was used for a headdress of the high priest. And so I said hat, but it's the headdress. It is derived from a verb signifying to roll or to wind around, possibly intimating the high priest's mitre was round around, uh, wound around his head. Whew. These are tongue twisters tonight. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm a little bit on the struggle bus. <laughs> Hallelujah with some of these. Uh, the mitre covering the head of the high priest was a type of his being subject to God and that he was always supposed to be standing in the presence of God. He was never too close to lose sight of his glorious calling, but his life was to be spent in the tabernacle, ready to accomplish God's will. <coughs> the white fine linen of which it was made, is an emblem of that righteousness and purity that must be manifest in one who stands in the presence of God on the behalf of others. And of course, Jesus was. Remember, the lamb had to be a lamb without spot, the sacrificial lamb. Amen. The golden plate. The golden plate is described before the mitre, the object of the mitre being to enable the high priest to wear this plate of gold before the Lord. Deeply engraved on this gold plate was the writing, Holiness to the Lord, without which he could not appear in the presence of the Lord in the behalf of Israel. What a volume of truth this little sentence does contain. How expressive of him who alone has a title to bear it, the true high priest. The forehead is, is um, especially that portion of the human countenance on which is depicted the purpose, will, and mind. Throughout his earthly ministry, holiness to Jehovah was the ruling purpose in Christ's mind. <clears throat> Aaron could present holiness to Jehovah only engraved upon the holy crown on his forehead. Christ is holiness to Jehovah. Aaron stood on behalf of Israel. Christ not only stands on behalf of his people, but they are united with him in his life. Praise the Lord. So each one of these aspects of the um, the priest's garment uh, had symbolism, typology, for which Christ were to... Um, come and fulfill uh, and then next week we'll get into the offerings start getting into the offerings but let's go ahead and answer our questions from this week um, praise the Lord why was a priesthood necessary uh, the tabernacle would have been useless without its vessels and the tabernacle with its vessels would have been in no service but for a living, living family of priests constantly engaged in various activities within the holy place 
and about the various holy vessels because they acted as mediators. All right. This was going to be big. Give at least three contrasts or similarities between the high priest of the old covenant and Jesus, our high priest of the new covenant. And I did it one better. I got four. Hallelujah. All right. Contrast. The leadership or kingship of Moses, as well as the office of mediator, were in him kept apart from the priesthood, which was confined to Aaron and his sons, and these dignities were thus lodged in different persons. Whereas, one epistle to the Hebrews is to point out that the Lord Jesus in his resurrection, combining in himself the various offices and dignities, the Lord, mediator, apostle, surety, captain, and shepherd. Second, similarity. The wording of the first verse is remarkable. Take, uh, that's Exodus 28, 1. Take unto thee Aaron and his sons with him that he may minister. Aaron and his sons formed but one ministry in the priest's office, and Aaron could not exercise his service unless his sons were taken with him. Is there not in this an intimation of the union and priesthood of Christ and his house? And that one great object of his priesthood is that he has many, that he, that, is that he may minister to God representing his house. I had a typo there. <clears throat> I had many instead of may. Um, the high priest of the law had compassion upon the ignorant and on them. And so then the similarity of the high priest, not just of the um, priesthood, but of the high priest, uh, upon them that were out of the way because he was conscious of infirmities himself. The very fact that he was a sinner, that was the, the earthly high priest, was on qualification, a qualification for that priesthood. The Lord Jesus, through his human life, was perfected for priesthood. He is able to sympathize because he had been tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. He suffered being tempted and is therefore able to succor them that are tempted. Um, praise the Lord. And then another, um, the priests of the house of Levi were made without an oath. And in consequence, some of them were cut off from the priesthood, as in the case of Nadab, Abihu, Eli's line, the Lord Jesus was made priest with an oath. The Lord swear and will not repent. The unchangeableness of God's word and oath established it. The Lord Jesus as the surety of the better covenant. What did the priest's garments typify? Uh, they typify the various powers, responsibilities, and qualities associated with that office. And explain Hebrews 7, 11 through 17. Aaron was made a priest after the law with carnal commandments, whereas Christ became a high priest after the power of endless life. The glorious eternal power of resurrection Life received out of death and making manifest his victory over death constituted him the great high priest. What is the significance of the breastplate with the names of the precious stones? Because the precious stones shine more brightly or brighter, <clears throat> the light these stones were uh, maintained in divine presence is undiminished, undiminished luster and unaltered beauty which belong to to the position in which the grace of God had set them. Whatever the failures of Israel might be, their names glittered before him. Jehovah had set them where no man could pluck them. No one could enter the holy place to dim their luster. The first row, a sardis, topaz, and carbuncle. Second, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third, a ligure, a gate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. And what truth to the body of Christ is revealed here? God was able to create variety without involving inferiority. And it was so with the individuals that composed the body of Christ. And yet Christ is seen in each with a particular beauty and glory into which another does not intrude. Each has his place in the body a responsibility to magnify Christ that does not belong to another in the view of the Father. The body shines with the brightness and the righteousness of 
Christ. And what were the two memorials of Israel? The two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod were the names of the children of Israel engraved upon them to be born before the Lord on the shoulders of Aaron. And what two memorials do we have that correspond to them? Um, one of them is our absolute redemption from the kingdom of darkness through the blood of the Lamb and our standing before God as his children upheld in the presence, in his presence, in all glory and righteousness. Explain the Ermim and the Thuman. Ermim means light, Thuman means perfection. These mysterious contents of the breastplate seem to direct our thoughts to the heart of the Lord Jesus as containing all light and perfection, all grace and truth, all mercy and righteousness. And what did the golden bells and pomegranates signify? Pomegranates signify fruits gathered from the earth. Thus the high priest proclaimed on the entrance into the holiest that he had come from the world, um, proclaiming his earth walk. The golden bell sent forth a heavenly melody. And when he would return again from the immediate presence of the glory into the camp, his retiring footsteps rang out an unearthly sound. They proclaimed his heavenly walk in the most holy place. And last, what does the mitre signify on the head of the high priest? The mitre covering the head of the high priest was a type of his being subject to God and that he was always supposed to be standing in the presence of God. The white fine linen of which it was made is an emblem of the righteousness and purity which must be manifested in one who stands in the presence of God on the behalf of others. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so even down to the garments and dress of the high priest, we see God pointing to Jesus and in pointing to Jesus, pointing to our redemption and reconciliation to himself in perfect harmony with the heart and plan of a father and his family. Glory be to God. I say glory be to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So um, we're glad you could be with us tonight and um, trust that your studying this is, is just opening your eyes to the glorious truths that our whole, the whole Bible <coughs> was written as a blueprint of the plan of redemption for God and fallen humanity to be reconciled through a supernatural plan that the Father birthed out of his own heart, manifested in Jesus Christ, bringing us back into harmonious relationship with himself through the offering of his own son as he fulfills all of these allegories and types. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Amen. Um, it's time to give. If you want to give an offering tonight, you can do so through Cash App, uh, dollar sign Faith Victory Church, and uh, PayPal, uh, donations at fvc.org is the PayPal uh, connection. And uh, we'd love for you to be a part of what we do here at Faith and Victory Church. God's doing wonderful, marvelous things in our midst, and uh, we'd love to have you be a part of it. Praise God. And Father, we bless those tonight who tithe and give. Thank you that heaven's windows are open unto them, and that you empty out on them blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Uh, don't forget to join us this Sunday. Uh, at one o'clock at uh, where we're meeting currently at New Life Family Church on 6701 Ken Coy Road in High Point. Um, love to have you come out and be with us and see what God's doing and uh, be a part of a live service and uh, give us an opportunity uh, to meet you for the Spirit of God to minister to you and um, just the time in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Till we meet again, I want to remind you of these words of 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even 
our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Good night.